worship with you, and uh, thank you for uh, for leading that worship, Cly- uh, Clive, isn't it? Yeah, thank you very much indeed, and uh, thank you for reading that. <clears throat> actually, I'm glad that uh, your reading says um, a city built on a hill, because actually the new NIV has sort of translated that as uh, a town uh, built on a hill. But um, a city is right, and it's it's really referring to Jerusalem. Uh, pretty un- unambiguously, so the, 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 the newer translation quite has missed that a little bit. Anyway, we'll get to that. Anyway, thank you for being here. And uh, it was really nice to be with you yesterday. It was a great opportunity just to share uh, some of the insights from God's Word together. And so you've asked me to speak on this passage from the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, I'm obviously really delighted to be able to do so. Um, and uh, can we just sort of recognize from the start that you've actually asked me to speak about good deeds. So there you are, you know, good deeds. I say this because very often uh, the way we present the gospel uh, is something along the lines of, uh, you know, there's nothing that you can do to make God love you more. And that is, of course, quite true. But it tends to be heard as, there's no point in doing anything because it doesn't change anything from God's perspective, and that is, of course, quite wrong. Um, so we're talking about good deeds here. Um, uh, the 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 other attitude has the habit. I know, in you know, in my own uh, circle, that that attitude has the habit of making us feel a bit passive about things, passive about, I don't know, environmental changes, maybe, or or hopeless in the sen- in the terms of. Um, feeling that there's not much to be done about the decline in our society or something like that. So whatever this passage is about, it's meant to result in good deeds that glorify God. Maybe glorify, it says praise, you read praise our God. I think glorify probably is better. But um, either way, that, that results in God receiving more glory. On the other hand, uh, one of the main things that I'm really not interested in is making people feel guilty um, I just, it's just not an approach that I like, mainly because I don't like being made to feel guilty myself. So um, let's just acknowledge right off the bat that uh, uh, we could, uh, our prayer life could be better. Your prayer life could be better. Your prayer life could be better. Uh, we could probably give more. Uh, we could probably spend more time with our families. Uh, we could love people more. We could love God more. Anything else? Of course, yes, we read the Bible more. There, that's another one. Uh, I don't think I've uh, missed anything else. So, uh, you know, and of course, we could do more good deeds for the glory of God. Yes, okay, we could, we could. And, you know, but I'm not interested in trying to make people feel guilty about that. Uh, So let's put that to one side. From here on in, I just want to sort of share my insights uh, and my heart for society and uh, hopefully encourage us uh, to talk together uh, more about what we could do differently to sort of live out this passage in our community. So that's my heart for this passage. Let's start with the context, Um, the Sermon on the Mount. The context, chapter 4, is the growing number of followers uh, or specific disciples. Jesus has started to choose disciples. Uh, Jesus is attracting more and more people because he is bringing healing and restoration to many people in the land of Galilee. And, uh, you know, it's, you're supposed to hear, we were, we were talking about echoes yesterday, weren't we, and illusions. You're supposed to hear the echo of uh, Moses on Mount Sinai when Jesus goes up uh, onto the mount to give his sermon. So a bit like Moses on Mount Sinai, who goes up, who brings down ten commandments, followed by a list of other commandments. Well, now Jesus is on the, like a sort of new Moses. He's on the mount, and he brings us uh, Beatitudes, followed by a whole load of other uh, teachings. And so he's bringing us his values, his theology for what his people should look like, the people of God. And um, when we look at the Beatitudes, and this will be relevant because I'll refer to this a little later on, when we look at the, the Beatitudes, they are, they are not spoken, as it were, to different groups of people, you know, as if 
you people on the left hand side there, you're the mourning, so that's okay. You know, you're going to be uh, blessed. You're going to be comforted if you're mourning. And you people over there, it's, it's not like that. It's not sort of specific groups of people. Um, it's, these are the characteristics of those people who are going to be my new people of God, says Jesus. These are all characteristics. It's a holistic, um, these are the attitudes, the beautiful attitudes. I quite like that as a way of phrasing the Beatitudes. These are the beautiful attitudes of the people of God that are being formed around Jesus. If you are my followers, says Jesus, then you will be poor in spirit. You'll mourn. You'll be meek. You'll be hungry for righteousness. You'll be merciful. You'll be pure in heart. You'll be peacemakers. You'll be persecuted. And you will have the kingdom of heaven. And you'll be comforted because of that. You'll inherit the earth. You'll be filled. You'll be shown mercy. You'll see God and be called children of God. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. See, it's not a sort of pick and mix uh, outline. It's the whole package. These are the attributes. These are the attitudes of God's people. And so, it is interesting, isn't it, that at that point, Jesus says, don't worry too much about being persecuted. No, oh, <laughs> don't, don't like that bit so much. Don't, don't be worried about persecuted or when you're insulted. Instead, be glad, like the prophets before you, because they also suffered for bringing the good news to, uh, of God to their nation. So that's our context, and of course that's a real challenge in itself, obviously. But our passage is salt and light. So that first verse, uh, verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. And, um, you know, the, it, there's a, a parallel passage in Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 14, uh, verses 34 to 35. There, it says, uh, there's a reference to manure, which is, you know, not something you often speak about at church. Uh, But it's the manure. It says, it is fit neither for the soil nor the manure pile. It's thrown out. Well, you know, that uh, that should give us a steer as to how to understand this passage about the salt. Uh, because whereas um, I, I, when I was growing up, it was Out of the Salt Shaker by somebody. Do you remember that book? I can't remember who wrote it. Anyway, Elizabeth, somebody or other, maybe, I forget. But that was the sort of classic image about what this meant. Uh, you know, making uh, food taste better or something like that. I, I have to say, I think that the, the reference to, uh, to the, the earth and to manure points us in the right direction. It's salt of the earth. It's fertilizer. It's salt that makes the ground work better, be more fertile. And that was a common practice. I had to look it up, but uh, I did look it up and it's there. Uh, you, um, salt is, is very good. I mean, uh, it's used to preserve the manure. That's the, the thing I didn't know about that, to stop the manure going off so that it, it sort of carries on uh, its, <laughs> its value. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? I know absolutely nothing about agriculture, but, you know, I know how to read a book. So uh, that's what I've done. Um, And uh, it does make sense of this passage and its context. I think when Jesus is saying, you are the salt of the earth, the salt of the ground, or you could translate it the salt of the land. Um, When he's saying that you are the salt of the earth, um, I think he's saying something like, you're what helps things to grow well in the world. That's, I think, the meaning. You're the stuff, you're the right kind of stuff that transforms dead, barren land into fertile soil. You're you're that kind of stuff. And salt, apparently, I was reading this, helps to retain water, it deters weeds, It frees up minerals in the soil to nourish plants. So there you are. I hope you feel very educated this morning. I certainly did when I was reading it. So to be salt of the earth is to be 
life-giving agents of growth and of change. We are the ones to enable a harvest where there was barrenness. And, you know, we are the ones to get our hands dirty. That's the image. Get stuck in there. And if we are not agents of growth or enrichment, then, says Jesus, what use are you? That's a hard saying. That's really tough. If we're not agents of growth or enrichment, then, you know, I really don't like the idea of God thinking people being good for nothing to be trampled on. But there it is, and it's not my job to defend Jesus' words. So how do we understand this? Uh, It seems to me that the, the characteristic of the way that salt works is that it does so pretty invisibly. It's underground, it's messy, it's inglorious, it's tough. What is it? It's seen in the unseen kind acts of kindness that bring hope. It's in the prayers of those who are never thanked. Maybe it is loving a difficult neighbor. Maybe it is caring for a relative. It could be the kindness over the counter in the shops, sharing a word of hope with the hairdresser. It's holding a door open, saying thank you to others, giving up a seat. Above all, it is forming relationships with those who are spiritually barren, with those perhaps who do not even know that they are loved. That, I think, is the connection with the Beatitudes. It's putting those Beatitudes into action. It's seeing them at work. It is when we mourn with those who mourn. It's when we show mercy to the unlovable. It's when we make peace. It's when we endure persecution and hunger for righteousness. That is when we salt the ground, making it fertile for the growth of the kingdom of heaven. So that, I think, is the context of those who sow seed. You know, the the parable of the sower comes after that in Matthew 12. We're looking for a good soil that will produce a good harvest. Well, we need to salt it. Our job is to be the salt of the ground, to enrich our environment in readiness for the gospel of God. How's that for a first half? It sort of sets the scene, doesn't it? Let's get stuck in there. How would that look like? That's what we have to try and think about. Okay, well that's, those are interesting words. How do we put that into practice? What does that look like in, in your context? Uh, and you can share. You see, I, I don't doubt at all that this is going on in spades here. <laughs> spades, that's a good idea. Um, but uh, maybe we should talk about it a bit more in terms of, you know, how is, how is the salting of the ground going? Well, what about light of the world? You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, how should we understand this idea of being light of the world? Well, in the, uh, if you've got it, in the previous chapter, if you've got your Bibles open, you'll see Matthew 4, uh, verses 15 to 16. He quotes Isaiah 9, uh, which is it's a really programmatic kind of quotation here for, for Matthew's Gospel, for Jesus. Um, he says he, he went to Galilee, to Zebulun and to Naphtali in order to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. So that's quoting Isaiah 9 verse 2. And uh, we looked yesterday briefly 
at uh, and one of the servant songs, and in the servant songs, it's all about that. So I'll just sort of quickly echo what I was saying earlier. Isaiah chapter 42, the first of the servant songs uh, in that passage, uh, the Lord says about the, uh, the servant in verse 6 and verse 7, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeons those who sit in darkness. And then again, we also quoted from a a passage, uh, chapter 49, another servant song, verse 5, Isaiah 49, 5. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to himself, to gather Israel to himself, I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has given me strength. He says, It's too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and to bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So it seems to me that from these passages, which are, uh, which are in Matthew's mind, uh, by pointing that, the, that this has got to be the light that's falling on the Gentiles and, and Jesus acting out as the servant, um, I think from these passages we could, we could understand that Jesus, in fact, is the light of the world. And in John's Gospel, very famously, one of the I am phrases that Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. Or, uh, yesterday, we read together from the start of John's Gospel, uh, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not understood it. So, in some way, Jesus is the light of the world. That's That's our sort of, you know, he's the servant. He's the one that is shining and bringing light into the darkness. But the servant of Isaiah is an embodiment of the people of God. The thing is, Israel's calling was to be a light to the Gentiles. That's what Israel was supposed to do all the time. Instead of sort of being a threat to the nations or the Gentiles or or being, you know, aggressive towards them or corrupting them, they were supposed to be the ones that showed what living in the kingdom of God looked like, what living in that sort of beautiful, uh, glorious way of of being close to the living God, what that looked like in practice. They were always supposed to be the, uh, the light. And so as people of God today, us, We are to do the things of the servant, and that is, I think, what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. It is reminding us, you, us, people of God, this was our job all along. We are to be reminded of what what we were supposed to be like. If we are Jesus' people, if we are the people of God, then this is what we will be like because we want to be like him. And he is the light of the world. So Jesus is telling his disciples that you are the people who have seen a great light and therefore he is telling them that they are now responsible for taking that light to others. And that's the, the illustration of the city on a hill. And that is definitely Jerusalem, no doubt about it. It was supposed to be with the glory of God dwelling in the temple with the law going out and the Gentiles streaming to it. And again, we read from Isaiah yesterday, this time Isaiah 60. And this is about Jerusalem. This is about the center of the people of God. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth. And thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kingdoms to the brightness of your dawn. The sun will no longer, this is a little bit later on, that same passage, Isaiah 60, this is verse 19 now. The sun will no longer be 
your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set again, and your moon will wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of sorrow will end. That was supposed to be the destiny of the city of God, Jerusalem. And, of course, we anticipate that, dis- that destiny when we reflect on Revelation 21, the new Jerusalem that descends like a bride from heaven to earth to the new creation. So that's the vision. That's our destiny. And in the meantime, in the overlap of the ages, that's what I was saying a little bit about yesterday, The fact that there's a now and a not yet. But as we live in the now of the end times, we are to live our lives as that holy city with the gates that are always open because we are so united with the servant king, our Lord, that we shine his light. Now that all sounds incredible. It sounds really amazing, but it also sounds a bit overwhelming. You know, a bit unachievable. Uh, but by way of encouragement, I, you know, we mentioned this yesterday. Let me remind you that Jesus was often misunderstood too. He was often, you know, not his value was not fully understood, even by John the Baptist who went, you know, who asked, are you really the one? Is this what it looks like? So um, be encouraged that, uh, you know, it, it is, it's an achievable thing. It's like what Paul says. The word is not too far from you. It's not up in heaven that we'd have to go up there or, or over the seas or down in the, in the depths. No, it's near to you. It's in your heart. It's on your lips. And, uh, you know, Paul was certainly always getting into trouble all the time when he was trying to be the light of the world. So success may not always be apparent in worldly terms when we try to live this out. But, um, (laughs) and really in order to illustrate that, the last part of my sermon, I just wanted to sort of describe a couple of ways that I'm trying to put this into practice, uh, mainly so you can judge yourselves to be vastly superior to my rather limited attempts, but but also so you you can say, yeah, yeah, I I can do much more than that. That's, (laughs) That's what it looks like. So I'm trying to encourage you. Here's my account of the good works that I try to do to be salt and light uh, in the world. Well, it's true that I teach in a Bible college, and uh, it is definitely my privilege to share these kinds of things with students that God sends us. Uh, but that's really not what I'm, I'm primarily focusing on at the moment. I want to, uh, actually, I'll tell you the first thing. I'm doing some research at the moment. I've got study leave, believe it or not. First time in my life. I've got some time off to do some work. And I'm writing up my thesis. Uh, And uh, my research was about what happens when you teach Christian students about science uh, from a Christian worldview. Because uh, science in school and on TV, it tends to be dominated by Darwinian ideas and by very atheistic principles. And so I, uh, I thought, well, let's run a course. Let's run a course on uh, doing science from, from a, 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 a theistic perspective, from a Christian perspective. Well, it turns out that if you show them how science points to an intelligent designer, it gives students loads of confidence in God's word. You'd never believe it, would you? <laughs> and it enables them to start conversations with people who are rather cut off from faith in God because of their, their belief in science, frankly. You've probably met folk like that. You've probably got them in your family. No, I, I'm not interested in, in church. I, I, just, you know, I just believe in science. Shouldn't we need to <laughs> I, 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 I'm doing the thesis. I'm writing the book on it. <laughs> and that's one way that I try and be the salt of the earth. I try to make the ground more fertile for people so that people might be able to to grow in their faith, to have that seed planted. So you see, I I think that the worldview that says that if you want to be a Christian, 
Well, then fine. But uh, do it in your own time, in private. You know that worldview that says, you know, church is for Sunday only? Uh, it says, don't bring it into the public realm. I just think that's so wrong. That worldview is so wrong. It's darkness, that worldview. And it's a powerful force. It, it really does say, you keep your beliefs private, uh, whilst, whilst, of course, what they're saying is, uh, we feel free to indoctrinate children at school about, with our beliefs, our atheistic beliefs. Uh, or, in fact, to sack those who hold Christian views from their jobs. You know, there's two really important court cases going on just at the moment. Uh, one where a hospital trustee was sacked for saying that children are better off in a home with male and female parents, a mum and a dad, rather than parents of same sex. And uh, because he held that view and expressed it, he was sacked. He was no longer compatible with being a trustee of an NHS hospital. Another is where a student uh, was kicked off his social work course for saying in a private Facebook uh, message uh, that he thought homosexuality was sinful. And so he's, he is no longer accepted uh, to study for social work because he's expressed those Christian views. Um, now, you know, these are barren times, but it's situations like these that provide us opportunities to say, well, you know what, our Christian faith is just not something we keep private. It's not, it's not you know, it's not like a hobby that we practice on a Sunday. It's, it's our core identity. And actually, just this last week, um, uh, Sajid Javid was being interviewed on the radio. And uh, he, he said um, he doesn't think that religion is something that should define a person. He's just completely wrong. He's just wrong about that. And that is a worrying sign if he's the Home Secretary. Our Christian faith is the ground of our being. Uh, we are first and foremost servants of our Lord Jesus. And everything else takes a distant second place. So that's me trying not to lose my saltiness. What about me being the light of the world. Well, uh, a few years ago, I was chatting with a friend of mine about uh, prison ministry. I've never done it. Anybody done prison ministry? Not anybody here. Was that, was that a hand at the back there? No. Um, uh, well, a student of mine had become a prison chaplain. Actually, she's amazing. She, I was really impressed. Uh, she has a fantastic ability to, uh, to relate with the prisoners and to uh, share the gospel with those who are uh, just obviously uh, unable to get to church. And then it struck me that there were uh, other groups of, of prisoners who were unable to get to church and for whom, you know, this might be the last opportunity to uh, share the gospel with them. And of course, I talk, I'm talking about old folks' homes you know, this, is, uh, this was my moment of revelation. Oh, this is, I mean, okay, they're really nice prisons. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I mean, they're lovely, some of them. Uh, but, but many people of them simply can't get out because of ill health or infirmity. Um, and so this friend and I, uh, we suggested that we ran a church service for them in their home. And so, in fact, for the last seven years, uh, we've been involved in a ministry that we call Cedar Ministry, where several teams from our church in, in Chichester go out once a month to old folks' homes. We've, we do about uh, five or six of them now. And we lead a service there and instead of going to a church at, uh, at, um, in Chichester. <clears throat> and it's a brilliant ministry because it gives so many people in the congregation, in our congregation, opportunities to be involved in a service. The old folks are, quite literally, a captive audience, so that's nice. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the, the carers, they're usually really delighted that someone will provide that kind of spiritual service. Actually, it's, it's part of their obligation, and they, quite, they find it quite tricky to fulfill that obligation. So when you turn up and say, would you like us to lead a service, they go, oh, yes, 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 that'd be really super. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so, you know, we just sing hymns. We read a poem. Actually, that's become a really important part of our service, actually. One of our 
uh, helpers. She just brings a, it's usually an Eddie Askew poem. And it's, it's just appropriate, it's brilliant. And then uh, one of us, often me, will give a short sermon. And then one of us will lead prayers and we always say the Lord's Prayer. And then afterwards we share a cup of tea with them and we offer to pray with them. And, you know, offering to pray with them. They're usually very willing to be prayed for because they are worried about their families now that they can't have, you know, such an active role with them. A lot of them are depressed because they've lost their husband, usually, or their wife. And, uh, and often they can't see very well or they can't read anymore. And um, these services are a sort of outpost of the kingdom of God. They're beacons of light, I think, offering hope and a chance to respond to the gospel. And perhaps, you know, um, this is the last time that some people will ever get a chance to respond to that gospel message of the kingdom of God. We've even had a baptism in one of our services. That was quite special. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, one or two uh, have given us the opportunity to be involved in their funerals as well. The families have asked us to do that. And I would just love it if this congregation would catch that vision and would see one of your local old folks' homes as a mission field where the church could be a light of the world in a lonely and anxious place. So, uh, how's that as an application of this passage that you've asked me to speak on? And, and really, that's the best I got anyway. <laughs> that's all it is. And, uh, you know, I am sure... And, uh, and I hope that you will take the opportunity. But given the opportunity, I am sure that uh, you could share many more impressive ways in which you make the land salty. And that as a church, you show yourselves to be the light of the world. But the point is, you are the people of God. And we are doing the good works of the servant King Jesus who is himself the light of the world. And as we seek to live out our identity as the people of God, I pray that people will see our good deeds and will glorify our Father in heaven. Amen.